More news continues to break in the case of Jeffrey Epstein, the multimillionaire alleged to have supplied underage girls to some of the most powerful former presidents named Bill in the country. New York medical examiner Barbara Sampson released her autopsy report declaring that Epstein committed suicide by wrapping his hands around his own throat and slamming his face into the floor of his cell repeatedly until he stopped struggling with himself. Loony internet conspiracy theorists noted Sampson kept jiggling her eyebrows as she spoke, and many conjecture she was sending a message in Morse code saying, quote, I'm lying. Epstein was murdered. They're holding my family hostage. Someone please call the police, unquote. The Emmy's office issued a statement saying the conspiracy theory was absurd, and Miss Sampson just happens to have eyebrows that twitched in Morse code. Attorney General William Barr, meanwhile, fired Sidney Blumenthal, the man temporarily in charge of the prison where Epstein killed himself. Blumenthal protested he did nothing wrong when he took Epstein off suicide watch, sent all the prison video cameras out for repairs, gave the prison guards the day off for a late Cinco de Mayo celebration, and told Epstein's fellow prisoners if they said one word to anyone, they'd think Epstein got off easy. The disgruntled Blumenthal says he'll retire now to his private island in the Caribbean, which he bought with money left over from the Fund for Haitian Hurricane Relief, which was a gift from a friend. The United Kingdom's Prince Andrew, who was caught on video inside Epstein's mansion, released a statement saying, quote, I find it abhorrent that Epstein and his friends were enjoying the tender flesh of exquisitely young girls to their heart's delight until they could barely see through the fog of pure pleasure, and I'm appalled that anyone would suggest I was a part of those glorious, glorious days, unquote. Officials say the facts will... <laughs> <laughs> will continue to pile up until the truth is completely buried. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky doo Ship-shaped, dipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. You know, when I was more active in the movie business, I had this friend uh, with whom I worked on several projects. And whenever we'd hit a snag or get in a fight with a studio, my friend would shrug and say, it's an uptown problem. What he meant was whether we won or lost, whether we got our movie made or crashed and burned, we were still having a good time and making a lot of money doing something many people would kill to be able to do. Almost every issue facing America today is an uptown problem. Our border is under siege because people want to live here because it's so great. Our politicians want to rob and divvy up the spoils because there's so much spoils to divvy up. We have entanglements overseas because we have the means and power to handle those entanglements while others don't. Even the social questions that arise are questions that only arise when your basic needs have been taken care of. In a non-technological tribe struggling for survival, gender roles and sexual morality aren't elective. They're essential. Babies are precious. Women have to bear them and take care of them. Men have to protect the women while they do that. Virginity gives men a reason to protect the women and children because it's proof of fatherhood. If no one else had her, the kid must be yours. Homosexuality, which some say doesn't even exist in primitive societies, is a dangerous waste of human resources, and so on. Likewise, it's probably not an accident that the universal human practice of slavery was rolled back at the same time the Industrial Revolution rolled in and more slave work could be done by machines. It's probably not an accident that people began to feel a tender concern for indigenous peoples only after their homes were secure from aboriginal attacks. None of this is a judgment on what's actually right or wrong. It's only to say that some virtues, like being anti-slavery, may be luxuries. They're good ideas we can now afford to have because those who came before us created a world in which we could afford to have them. And other virtues may only be luxuries and not virtues at all. Gender roles and sexual morality, for instance, may be good ideas whether they're survival necessities or not. But in any case, and in every case, once we begin to understand that our problems are uptown problems, we also understand that we live in time and we live in a specific time. We weren't just planted in this prosperity. It was created for us before we got here. We should look backward with gratitude to the people who made this country and move forward with humility because you never know what luxurious new idea might bring your rich, fat, happy civilization tumbling down around your ears, at which point survival be will become an issue once again and luxurious virtues will become luxuries we can't afford. We'll talk about that more in a sec, but first, let us talk about Ring. 
You know Ring. I mean, we all know Ring at this point. It is a wonderful, wonderful series of devices that will keep your home safe. It is a great, great thing when somebody comes to your door to be able to see them on your phone wherever you are and talk to them and find out what they're doing there. Ring's mission is to make neighborhoods safer, and they're doing just that, protecting millions of people everywhere. Ring helps you stay connected to your home anywhere in the world. They have smart doorbells. That's what they call them. Uh, They also have the motion-activated floodlight cam, which turns on a floodlight anytime somebody steps on your property. Excellent way to make sure you know what's going on at your home all the time. If there's a package delivery surprise visitor, you'll get an alert, be able to see, hear, and speak to them all from your phone. As a listener, you have a special offer on a Ring Starter Kit available right now. You get a video doorbell and the motion-activated floodlight cam. The Starter Kit has everything you need to start building a ring of security around your home. Just go to ring.com slash Clavin for this special offer on the Ring Starter Kit. That's ring.com slash Clavin. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how do you spell Clavin? Hit it, boys. Been a while since we played, played that. It's a, it's a great, it's a great song. It's a work of art. Uh, the mailbag. Get your questions. <laughs> yes, I, as I was saying, the mailbag. Get your questions in now. Uh, you want to subscribe at dailywire.com. Hit the podcast button, the Andrew Claven podcast, and then you'll see that little mailbag symbol. Get your questions in. You've got to be a subscriber. A lousy ten bucks a month. A lousy hundred bucks for the entire year. You've got to be a subscriber. Then you can ask me anything you want. Uh, about religion, about your personal life, about politics, and all my answers are guaranteed 100% correct and will change your life on occasion for the better. But you want to get your questions in now because tomorrow is the uh, uh, live, backstage live, so I won't have a show tomorrow. I will have my mailbag show on Thursday, but I'll only have a time to curate the letters uh, today. So if you get them in now, I'll be able to pick out uh, your letter and answer your questions on Thursday. Um, so, you know, the reason I bring up the question of luxurious values is because so much of our conversation uh, goes on as if we just kind of, we just dropped here and all our values kind of rain down on us like a, out of the air. And we just kind of know these things. Bill Maher once said, it's common sense. Morality is common sense. If it's common sense, people would have thought of it before. <laughs> you know, a lot of our values are values in this moment. It doesn't mean they're not good values and it doesn't mean they are good values. It simply means they're values created in the moment. And that's why you know, we don't, this is why we don't cover up murals of George Washington, like I did, I think it was in San Francisco, because there were sla- pictures of slaves and all this stuff, because we understand George Washington lived in his time, and instead of saying, oh, he was bad because he held slaves, what we should say is a man that good, a man that virtuous, if, if, if a man that good and that virtuous held slaves, then what would we have done? We would have been even worse, because we are not as good, we're not as virtuous uh, as as George Washington, not not one of us really is. So, I mean, that's why we understand ourselves as living in time. And when we get a little breathing space, sometimes we can have values that our forebears couldn't have. They just couldn't have it. They couldn't afford. You know, you're standing out there on the frontier and Indians are attacking. You can't sit around and say, ah, the Native Americans, what a, what a wonderful group. Of people. You just have to kill them to protect your family. That's what you have to do. And so we can sit here and pass judgment on them, but we don't because we are safe. We're living in our safe places. We're surrounded by police. We're surrounded by army. We can afford to have these tender uh, feelings about all this, but we have to remember that those tender feelings exist in time. We all exist in time. And the issue of racism itself, the issue of racism itself is in fact, it's, a, it's a, in a way, it's an, a value we invented. The idea that racism is bad is a value that grows out of our philosophy, out of the West's philosophy, out of Christianity, but it takes thousands of years before it becomes uh, an issue. Look, in the old days, people, you know, a lot of lot of Indian tribes, for instance, just called themselves the people. We're just the people, right? Because everybody else is less than the people. The phrase barbarian 
comes from what it sounded like to the Greeks to hear foreigners talk. Ba ba ba. It sounds like they're stuttering. I think it's. I think it originates in Sanskrit, but wherever it comes from, it is a basically mockery of those people over there who don't know how to speak a civilized language like Greek. Bar. So they're barbarians. They go bar bar bar. So you know this is the, this is the thing we talk about. We talk about things like, oh, we're in a fight. You know, the, these primitive people are nationalists. Oh, these evil Trump supporters are nationalists, whereas we good people are globalists. We want everything to be. But those are all things that are created in time, right? Nationalism itself, you start with tribalism. You start with your tribe and you defend your tribe. And nobody ever said, you know, we're just going to let that other tribe that wants to come and take our food and take our women. We'll just let them come in and do that because that's the kind of great old people we are. We're just that kind of great people. Nobody thinks about that. Why do people become nationalists? People become nationalists because of transportation and communication gets big enough where you can start to communicate with a place that's defined geographically, like the island of Great Britain, right? You can start to uh, communicate with all those people. Now you have a nation because it's all the tribes that are living under the aegis of maybe this one conquering king. And that's how nationalism comes uh, comes to be. Well, where does globalism comes, come from? The same thing. Globalism is only created once you know where the globe is, first of all, once you know what's on the globe, and once you can communicate in an instant from one place to another. So we are a global civilization. It's not a question of whether we're going to be a global civilization. We already are. It's a question of uh, what that global civilization is going to look like. And when you have a nation, right, your nation is defined by geographical boundaries, by how far you can communicate, by how much of a, uh, a territory one king can rule, all right, until something happens. Guess what that is? It's the creation of the United States. And then that's when you have the issue of racism. I'll get back to that in just a moment. But let's first talk about Lightstream. I know we all do this. I don't have to make it personal. I, I do it all the time. I use credit cards without thinking. I use credit cards because they're these wonderful pieces of plastic. And people give you stuff. It's just amazing. They give you coffee. They give you food. give you objects. It's wonderful. And then suddenly at the end of the month, this funny little thing shows up called your bill. And if you don't pay your credit card bill, you get nailed with interest that is unbelievable. But but you can get a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream and get a rate as low as 5.95% APR with auto pay. That's way lower than the average credit card interest rate of over 19% APR. And if you have any idea of how interest works, that's bad. Plus, the rate that you get from Lightstream is fixed, so it'll never go up over the life of the loan. You can get a loan from 55000 to 100000 with no fees, and you can even get your money as soon as the day you apply. Just for my listeners, Apply now to get a special interest rate discount. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash Andrew. That's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash Andrew. Subject to credit approval, rate includes 0.50% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash Andrew for more information. So, the idea of racism only becomes an issue when you create a country that is defined by something new. It's not defined by territory. It's not defined by the area that you can communicate with. It is defined by an idea. And yes, it is It is held upon a certain piece of land, and that land is ultimately defined uh, by how much of it is, is under our control and by natural borders and natural uh, you know, uh, coastlines and all that stuff. But, but who becomes part of that country is who ascribes to the ideas under which the country is founded. And that's when racism becomes an issue because suddenly you and the Irish guy next to you or the Italian guy next to you or the black guy next to you, suddenly you are countrymen. You are not just, you know, uh, uh, people of, of basically the same race, basically the same kind, living on an island or living in a nation based on uh, on the the uh, people who conquered that place, you are there ascribing to an idea together. And that's when racism becomes a problem. It is essentially, essentially an uptown problem like everything else. And that's why, this is why I think conservatism is progressive, whereas progressivism is regressive. Pro conservatism is basically saying these values, these values that shaped our country, that shaped our world, should be kept in place because they are the values that created the idea of racism. Racism was not a problem anywhere else. Nobody ever sat around. I mean, in Rome, they had a little bit of this because Rome was a multi-ethnic empire, but it was a multi-ethnic empire. Nobody de uh, denied that it was run by the Romans in Rome. And as the people surrounding Rome wanted more and more rights, they had 
all kinds of tremendous fights about that. But still, Rome was a multi-ethnic empire. We are a multi-ethnic nation. That is an entirely new idea. And that's when racism becomes a problem, when you got to say, oh, this guy next to me is my countryman. When we go to war, he and I are going to be in a foxhole together. So therefore, we are brothers in arms and brothers in, in a nation. And that makes racism a problem. Because if you don't like the guy because he's Italian or Irish or Jewish or black, then it's a problem. And that's why conservatism, we are trying to conserve ideas that create this idea that that makes racism a problem where the left is going to progress right back to the past. They want to progress right back to the past. And that's why you see what's happening now is this upsurge, this upsurge of racism uh, on the left. We talked yesterday about Heather McDonald's great piece in the Wall Street Journal. It's still available. It, uh, Wall Street Journal is behind a paywall because they want to get paid for their work, <laughs> which I, I know what a concept. But, but Heather McDonald wrote a great piece saying it's not Donald Trump who brings up race all the time. It's the left interpreting what he says as racist, but the left is constantly talking about whiteness and blackness and identity and all these different things that are a problem. And now it's all coming home to roost. It's all becoming visible in their anti-Semitism problem. You know, it's really interesting. They had this thing in in Portland over the weekend where Antifa and the the fascists who call themselves anti-fascists and the Proud Boys who seem to have... (laughs) a little bit of a, a democracy problem themselves, we're, we're fighting each other, right? They're out there. They're going to have uh, demonstrations and counter demonstrations. And Antifa, Antifa is just an absolutely miserable, violent leftist organization. And Proud Boys seem to be uh, instigating violence, too, in the name of white supremacy. So Sean Hannity goes on TV, right? And Sean Hannity says, a, a pox on both your houses, a plague on both your houses. This is not the way this goes. We're one country, even though Sean is a deep, deep partisan, pro-Trump partisan. He is saying the people I argue with, I'm arguing with, right? We're not, we're not enemies. We're opponents in this fight. We're not hitting each other over the head with clubs. Here's just a taste of what uh, Sean said. But what matters here is we can have a thorough, complete, passionate, open discussion of ideas and ideals. We don't need fists and baseball bats and mace. Now, this show will always condemn hatred on any side. White supremacy, bigotry, you have no place in this society. None whatsoever. People chanting, what do we want, dead cops? When do we want them now? You, we, you are radicals and you're hurting our country. And you're putting the men and women that protect and serve us at risk. If you're an Antifa extremist, the same goes to you. What do they have in common? They're all tied to sick, ugly, twisted, evil ideologies. We've got to remain one United States. This is a country of God's greatest gift to man, created equal. God's natural rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's a gift for all of us, all American citizens. Sadly, we don't always see these values defended on the left. In fact, look at today. Two anti-Semitic members of Congress have been given a free pass from the media mob and the Democratic Party. Imagine if it was Trump, though. That's right. He's, he's absolutely right. He's talking about Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. Now, now remember, this is evil Sean Hannity on the evil right, right? The white supremacist. He's coming out and saying, no, no, that's not what this is about. It's about the ideas that bind us all together. And by the way, while the New York Times is going El Paso, El Paso, El Paso, El Paso, because that's where uh, a, a white supremacist shot people, only Hannity has been covering Chicago where the uh, left's policies have created uh, a, an inner city that is as violent as any place in America. Sean is covering that. He's got people going out there. So while we're saying this, he's absolutely right. Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, these two virulently anti-Semitic uh, Muslim women in Congress, they're claiming that they were denied entry into Israel, which is a half-truth. They were denied, they were allowed to go into Israel with a congressional delegation, a bipartisan Republican and Democrat congressional uh, 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 delegation. They went in staggered uh, times. I can't remember if it was the Republicans first, and then they overlapped with the Democrats, and then so they were both there together, and then the Democrats stayed, or maybe it was the other way around, but it was a, a bipartisan trip. They went over, they were perfectly allowed to go with them. They were banned when they wanted to go, sponsored by uh, a virulent uh, anti-Semitic group, MIFTA, which has uh, sent out blood libels, which is the most primitive form of anti-Semitism. Uh, they, they, they supported terrorism. They did all these things. And so now Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar stage a press conference that is one 
lie after another. We're going to start with Ilhan Omar. I have to tell you this. Ilhan Omar is kind of a, uh, an attractive lady, and she has a very lovely smile. And every time I, she smiles when she's saying the ugliest things, the ugliest things come out of her mouth, and she's got that smile on her face. Every time I see her, I think of this line from Hamlet. I, I quoted, I printed it out here because I uh, always misquote things, but it's, oh, most pernicious woman, Hamlet says, oh, most pernicious woman, oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain, my table's meet it is, I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. Every time I see Ilhan Omar, I think one may smile and smile and be a villain because she keeps flashing that smile while she says the most hateful, hateful things. So here she is talking about our ally Israel, our pals uh, Israel, uh, and uh, the only democracy in the region. And when she says this, in case you're listening just and not watching, when she calls them the only democracy in the region, she uses scare quotes as if somehow that's not true, although I'd like her to show why it's not true. We give Israel more than $3 million in aid every year. This is predicated on their being an important ally in the region and the only democracy in the Middle East. But denying visit to duly elected members of Congress is not consistent with being an ally and denying millions of people freedom of movement or expression or self-determination is not consistent with being a democracy. We must be asking, as Israel's ally, the Netanyahu government stop the expansion of settlements on Palestinian land and ensure full rights for Palestinians if we are to give them aid. So they're not an ally. They're not a democracy. That's only just, those are scare quotes. And we must demand, you know, it, one of the reasons she has time to do this is because Congress doesn't do anything anymore. They don't actually pass any laws. So that she just has time to get in front of cameras and make a, a big fuss over the fact that she was not allowed to go. This anti-Semitic woman was not allowed to go with this anti-Semitic group into a country full of Jews for some reason. God knows why they wouldn't let her in. <clears throat> but they didn't want her to go in spewing the BDS stuff, uh, which would be incredibly destructive to Israel. So she says this long thing about the, that they're not really a democracy, they're not really an ally. And my question is, who is? Who in the Middle East is giving Muslims more rights than Israel? The Muslims within Israel, the Muslim citizens of Israel have more rights than they do in any Muslim country. Period. That's it. They have more rights in Israel than they have in any Muslim country. So who's she comparing them with? And why? Why is it Israel that's the problem? You know, this country, that country is so tiny. It is so small. If you've ever been there, you can, you can literally walk uh, the width of it. You know, in, uh, let's see, what would it take? It would take five hours, I think. That's what it would take to walk. I'm, I'm doing, doing that calculation in my head. It takes me 20 minutes to walk a mile. It's something like 15 miles across. Uh, so that would be, yeah, five hours uh, to, uh, to get across the entire country. And they're being shelled. They've been invaded all this stuff is happening, but all that history doesn't matter because she hates Jews. That's why. That's why. And she smiles and smiles and she is a villain. And then there is Rashida Tlaib, who is just a loon and just uses emotion and the tearing up. And she puts on a big parade. She went over. She was, wanted to go over and they wouldn't let her go over with this uh, anti-Semitic organization. So she said, well, please let me go over and visit my elderly grandmother because she's 90 and I'll never see her again. And this is my only chance. And they said, oh, all right, as long as you don't do any of this BDS stuff, you can go over and visit your grandmother. She said, no, I don't want to do it. Forget it. If I can't do my BDS stuff, I ain't going. And this is her, uh, her comment. As a young girl visiting Palestine to see my grandparents and extended family, I watched as my mother had to go to dehumanizing checkpoints. Even though she was a United States citizen and proud American, I was there when my city was in a terrible car accident and my cousins and I cried so she could have access to the best hospitals which were in Jerusalem. I remember shaking with fear when checkpoints appeared in the small village of Beit Aur al-Foka, tanks and guns everywhere. I remember visiting East Jerusalem with my then husband and him escorting, escorted off the bus, although he was a United States citizen, just so security forces could harass him. All I can do 
as my city's granddaughter, as the, as the granddaughter of a woman who lives in occupied territory, is to elevate her voice by exposing the truth the only way I know how. Yeah, well, when she starts to do that, we'll let you know. Meanwhile, it's all nonsense. I mean, the reason the reason you can't get in uh, into Jerusalem to get to the hospitals is because the uh, the Palestinians have sent suicide bombers through ambulances. They've sent them in ambulances to blow people up. The reason there's no hospitals where they are is because the Palestinian authorities spend the money. They get immense amounts of money in international aid, and they spend it on missiles to basically lob at Israel. And why are all the, where are all these checkpoints? Why is there this wall? That wall that works so well to keep terrorism out of Israel was built to keep terrorists out of Israel. So all of this is this imaginary world that they're living in, this fake world that they're living in, and selling to us because they're anti-Semites, because they hate Jews, and where are the Democrats? Where's the Sean Hannity of the Democrats condemning this? Hey, let me talk for just a second about bowl and branch sheets. I love these sheets. They're incredibly comfortable, incredibly nice to look at. Uh, for you, they will probably help you sleep because they're so comfortable. For me, they're just <laughs> lovely to look at while I'm lying awake asking myself uh, the big questions. What makes these sheets unique is each sheet is crafted from 100% organic cotton. That means bowl and branch sheets not only feel incredible, they look amazing. And since bowl and branch sells exclusively online. You don't have to pay that expensive retail markup. You get twice the quality for half the price. You will love these sheets. Try them for 30 nights and see for yourself. If you're not impressed, return them for a full refund. As I say, they, they, they feel better and better each time you wash them for some reason. I don't know why that is, but they really feel nice. They look nice. They are a pleasure to lie in. Possibly they're a pleasure to sleep and you'll have to let me know. Go to bowlandbranch.com today and you'll get 50 bucks off your first set of sheets plus free shipping in the U.S. when you use the promo code CLAVEN. That's 50 bucks off plus free U.S. shipping right now at bowlandbranch.com, spelled B-O-L-L and branch.com, promo code CLAVEN, bowlandbranch.com, promo code CLAVEN. How do you spell it? Here it is. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. No E's in CLAVEN. I just make it look this incredibly easy. Okay, so th this whole thing is just a sham. And where are where is the left? Where is the left? I mean, they're they're nowhere. All they're doing is supporting this this idea that somehow a congresswoman that f from a country that gets our aid from us has been denied entrance. They weren't denied entrance. They were denied entrance under the si under a situation that would have been deeply deeply harmful to Israel. Which, by the way, they never said they wanted to visit Israel. They said they wanted to vi visit Palestine. Pa you know, Palestine in and of itself denying the existence of this country. So where is the left? You know, Bill Maher. And I, I guess maybe maybe he's the guy to compare to Hannity in this case. I'm sure he would blow the top of his head off. I've always had respect for Bill Maher. He's always stood up uh, for free speech. He's stood up for diverse opinions. He stood up for the diversity of opinion, even though he's on the left. And I disagree with him about a lot of what he said, but I've always had respect for him. And he said this about uh, the, the system of thought that leads, that has led the left into anti-Semitism. Here it is. BDS is a bullshit purity test by people who want to appear woke but actually slept through history class. <laughs> it's That's true. Thank you. It's, it's predicated on this notion, I think it's, it's very shallow thinking, that the Jews are in Israel mostly white and the Palestinians are browner, so they must be innocent and correct and the Jews must be wrong. As, as if the occupation came right out of the blue, that this completely peaceful people found themselves occupied. Forget about the infitadas and the suicide bombings the and, and the rockets and how many wars. And uh, let me read Omar Barghouti is one of the co-founders of the movement. His quote, no Palestinian, rational Palestinian, not a sellout Palestinian will ever accept a Jewish state in Palestine. So that's where that comes from this movement, someone who doesn't even want a, Palest a Jewish state at all. Somehow this side never gets presented in the American media. It's very odd. He's saying that it's a, a shallow form of th thinking, but it's actually a regressive form of thinking. The idea, he's absolutely right. It's, it's, the, it's the brownness of the Palestinians and the fact that Israel has beaten them in wars, so it makes Israel look like the, the, West, the spearhead of Western civilization, which it is. So it's the Western civilization against the poor little minorities. All of this is a regressive way of thinking. It's the old way of thinking. It's the way of thinking that came before the Constitution, before the Declaration, before the, the invention of America, which was the invention of racism as a bad thing, because racism only becomes a bad thing when you redefine the nation as a series of ideas. 
conservatism is the progressive idea. Progressivism is going back to before, before America was formed. It is not such a good thing. Believe me, you won't like it there. If I, uh, all right. We, we're going to, you know, we're going to, interestingly, we have a, a guest coming on uh, named Mary Graybar, who has written this book called Debunking Howard Zinn. And so much of this, so much of this thinking is, is taught to people through uh, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States, because Howard Zinn is the guy who sells this idea, this idea that somehow you have to tell the story of America as a story of the uh, oppressed people. And I always, and he says, you know, I'm going to tell the story as from the position of the slaves and from the position of the Indians. And look, all those people have stories. And of course, they should be told. They are part of the story of America. But the question is, the question is, why is it? Why is Howard Zinn in a position to think about those stories? And of course, as I always, I always, whenever I go and talk to uh, college students, I always tell them, you know, I can do this to anybody. I can tell anybody's story like that. I can tell anybody's story and I'll pick out some poor guy in the audience and I'll say, let me tell your life story, but I'm going to start with your porn searches because we all do bad things. We all do squirrely things. We all have uh, immoral moments. We all have immoral practices. We all participate in the immorality of our day as people who uh, believe in abortion and participate in that immorality of our day and sometimes don't even know. Uh, they actually don't even know that it's a bad thing. And so it's easy, it's easy to tell those stories. Uh, you know, I, I want to just go back and talk about uh, the, the, peop the people on the left defending this idea, defending the idea of, of anti-Semitism because there's some kind of special goodness, as, as Marr was saying, there's some kind of special goodness to the Palestinians. Uh, Rich Lowry on, on CNN, they let an actual conservative on CNN, Rich Lowry got into it with Peter Beinart of the Atlantic, and Beinart just lost his stuff. He just lost it. And I started screaming as Lowry said to him, how can you support this organization, MIFTA, which has done, and the fact that these congresswomen have retweeted uh, anti-Semitic cartoons, how can you support all that? Why aren't you, why isn't that the same thing as all these accusations about white supremacy? Why is it Donald Trump is guilty of white supremacy because somebody else did something but these uh, congresswomen are not guilty of anti-Semitism when they actually hooked on to an anti-Semitic group. Are many Palestinians who believe that Palestinians have the use, right to use violence because of the daily violent oppression they feel? I disagree with them. I believe in only nonviolent protests. But the point is, every time any Palestinian leader or any Palestinian organization tries to expose what happens, this is exactly what happens. People what, try to discredit is... them because they don't want to talk about the real issue. The real issue is an absolutely indefensible denial of basic human rights. What's that have to do with supporting terrorism? I mean, it, no, no one has any problem with harshly criticizing Israel. That's fine. But you don't support blowing up innocent people. That's just a, a, a bottom line uh, no, uh, of, uh, something of, we all of course should agree not. on. The purpose behind f focusing on this is to try to distract attention from the reality on the ground, which is funded by American would you, tax dollars. Our tax dollars this, blow up the homes of people who cannot get permits to build because they're non-citizens under military so law. Would this be your standard for white nationalist organizations? Oh, they just say, not, they say some Hanana, racist I, I, things. No, Hanana, they I'm support sorry, some sorry, Rich, terrorism. Sorry, with all due respect, that's okay. you have You're not been there me. and seen this on the ground. I've, I know but, Hanana Shrawi. She is nothing close to a white nationalist. She is someone seeking but so, freedom. But then, from why does the organization people? why does the organization publish things supporting terrorism? See, the, like I said, the right, even even the most evil of right wingers, that evil Sean Hannity, are against this form of bigotry. Because, why? Because they ascribe to American values. The left has lost its way, and anti-Semitism is always the devil's flagpole. It always tells you when people have left their lost their way, and these people. Have. We've got a great guest coming up, I would, uh, as I was saying, Mary Graybar, uh, but we got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. Come to dailywire.com, subscribe, and get your mailbag questions in now uh, because we'll be answering them on Thursday, but I got to curate them today. So get your questions in today. Barr is a resident fellow at the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, the founder of the dissident prof uh, Professor 
education project. Uh, she taught at the college level for 20 years, most recently at Emory University, excellent university. She is the author of Debunking Howard Zinn, Exposing the Fake History That Turned a Generation Against America. Mary, are you there? I am here. Yes. Hi. Uh, hi. How are you doing? Thank you. For, <laughs> thank you for coming on. Uh, oh, you're welcome. Can you explain how powerful this guy Zinn is? I mean, explain the effects that he has had. Oh, it reverberates throughout education, throughout our culture. Um, I've been following this guy for about tw uh, 10 years now. And um, I see every year that his influence is increasing. Uh, he's, you know, his book, uh, A People's History of the United States, has become accepted in classrooms, especially in high school advanced placement courses. There are passages quoted in other textbooks and history books for children. Uh, there's the Zen Education Project. You, you can download materials, people. One uh, city council member took her oath of office on a people's history. Uh, there are songs written for him, dance, uh, dances choreographed in his honor, <laughs> uh, I, it, movies, uh, rock band songs. Uh, it, it's uh, Antifa, uh, Black Lives Matter. He's everywhere. So his basic idea is that we're the bad guys. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the United States is just rotten to the core and it needs to be overthrown. That's the message. Well, look, let's, <laughs> that, well, then let's, before, before we look at his message, who was he? I mean, what was, what was his life about? Well, uh, Howard Zinn died in 2010. He was born in 1922 in New York, grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, so when he was a teenager in the 1930s, uh, that was sort of the epicenter of the American communist movement. He got involved in the communist movement, uh, was a member of the Communist Party from about 1946 to 53, card-carrying member. I have that on pretty good authority, so we can, we're almost, you know, 100% certain of that. And, um, you know, gave up his party membership formally uh, in order to infiltrate the institutions, and he became a college professor, taught at Spelman College until 1963 and then uh, was fired and then landed on his feet at Boston University, where he gave John Silber a lot of grief until he retired in 1988, and then went on to make uh, movies, give lectures, uh, you know, go around the world, <laughs> mm. give courses here and there. You know, pretty much a life of, uh, of you know, luxury, what, you know, a lot of professors hope for. <laughs> <laughs> huh. But but a, but a communist uh, underneath. So, uh, oh yes, yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. his his in in the book, I, I know that he says I'm going to tell the uh, I'm going to tell this history from the point of view of the victims. Now that's a, an ideological point of view, and you can say that point of view is wrong. But is he is he factually wrong? Are the facts in the, the people's history incorrect? Yes, and that's uh, that's the reason I wrote the book because okay. a lot of people have fumed and you know, complained about it because it's anti-American. And what I've done is I've looked at his sources, um, saw where he plagiarized, saw where he twisted people's words around to mean the opposite, where he left out critical material, you know, in, in an ellipsis, uh, just outright, outright lied. Uh, so I've gone back through the sources and I've also checked out other reputable history books, um, not only by conservative historians, but also some liberal ones. And, uh, and if you look at just about any reputable history, uh, you will see that the points that Howard Zinn makes are just wrong. Hmm. They're, they're, they're factually wrong. Well, how does he get around? We're talking to Mary Graybar, the author of Debunking Howard Zinn, Exposing the Fake History that Turned a Generation Against America. What does he do with incredible American successes, like uh, just off the top of my head, like winning World War II? How does he, how does he underplay those? Oh, well, we were, we were uh, just like the Nazis, according to him. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I mean... How does he, wait, he, how does he get there? Uh, well, there, there's a good portion of my book devoted to what he says about the Japanese uh, American relocation camps and uh, what he does is he leaves out critical information. I mean, this was, this was just, um, it was like a, a mystery hunt, you know, you're looking for some treasure. 
he claims that no one knew about these relocation camps until 1945 after the end of the war because of an article in Harper's Magazine. Well, you know, I, I went and looked up some old Harper's Magazines in 1942. There was an article about, you know, the first one um, and, you know, that it was definitely not a concentration camp. But, uh, you know, and described life there that they were clean, the food was pretty good and so forth. Um, so, you know, while a lot of conservatives did not approve of uh, FDR's, uh, you know, uh, order at that time, uh, there, by no stretch of the imagination, can you say that those were anywhere close to concentration camps? Uh, so he uses things like that, uh, you know, twists the facts around to make this analogy between, uh, you know, the American government and uh, Nazi Germany. And what does he do? As you know, how, how does he get away? Uh, you know, most most American communists, the vast number of American communists, finally gave up on communism when they saw what Stalin was doing. When they saw it, when they saw the Soviet Union collapse, how does he get around that? I mean, what does he say about the Soviet Union uh, that that makes us as bad as they are? Well, he kind of thinks the way these Antifa people think. They think that, um, and this is the way he thought, he said, you know, a top-down bureaucracy or government is bad. Uh, but he would, uh, he was proposing this um, egalitarian government, real communism, you know, with, he called them local communist communities. So it just hasn't been tried, you know, the right way. You know, Stalin may have done some he did some bad things. <laughs> He's yeah. a leader with flaws. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, you know, but but we're going to get it right, you know. And you know, Ho Chi Minh, of course, was was great. He was the real Thomas Jefferson. But there is, but he puts out this sort of fantasy that if we just got rid of all government, especially you know uh, a government like ours and uh, an economic system uh, based on capitalism that we're going to get it right. We're going to, we're going to have this um, sort of, um, you know, uh, grassroots communism and everything's just going to be really, you know, just grand and people will, there's a passage I quote where he says, you know, people will, won't have to work as much. They'll have more time for leisure. There'll be plenty. There'll be no poor people, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be great. Yeah, it's good. Is there, yeah. do you have any, do you have any hope of rolling this back, this incredible influence that this essentially pernicious book has had on people? Is there any chance of fighting back, of rolling that back? Well, that's what my book is for. I wanted to give a tool to people. Uh, there have been efforts. Uh, there was a legislator in Arkansas who tried to introduce a bill. It went nowhere. He just wanted to keep the book out of public schools. Um, but what I've done is I've looked at Zinn's major points and sort of, and provided a rebuttal. And I've also pointed to other sources. So uh, uh, what a lot of um, defenders of Zinn and Zinn himself said was that well you just disagree because you disagree with my politics you know you're you're a, a right winger well no uh it's the facts and i lay it out you know these are the real facts this is what this conservative historian says this is what this liberal historian says this is where he plagiarizes and he plagiarizes uh, not from a history book, but from a book, a screed written by a socialist anti-Vietnam War activist for high school students. And that, and that forms the opening pages of his book, the, you know, the most famous ones where Columbus, um, you know, lands in the New right. World and is greeted by the Arawaks, <laughs> if you've read those pages. So... So this this is um, a systematic way to to go through the points he makes point by point and say this is this is where he lies this is where he misrepresents and plagiarizes. Mary Graybar, author of Debunking Howard Zinn: Exposing the Fake History That Turned a Generation Against America. Mary, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. Uh, you know, we had a little uh, trouble getting Mary on the line, so uh, we've gone a little long, so I'm going to have to stop there. But please let me remind you one more time, go to dailywire.com, subscribe, go to the podcast button, hit the Andrew Claven podcast, hit the mailbag, send your mailbag questions in 
today, and I will answer them all on Thursday. We won't have time to get them on Wednesday, so please get them in today. Uh, you can ask anything you want. Ask about religion. Ask about politics. Ask about your personal life, and all my answers are guaranteed 100% correct. will change your life on occasion for the better. I mean, where else, where else do you go? Where else do you go where for a 10 lousy bunk, bucks a month, you get all your questions answered and all your problems solved? Only here on The Andrew Clavin Show. I'm Andrew Clavin. I will see you live on The Daily Wire backstage live tomorrow, and then I'll be back on Thursday. Oh, hooray, hurrah. The Andrew Clavin Show is produced by Austin Stevens and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. And our supervising producers, are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Edited by Adam Saevitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. And our production assistant is Nick Sheehan. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. If you prefer facts over feelings, if you aren't offended by the brutal truth, if you can still laugh at the nuttiness filling our national news cycle, well, tune on in to The Ben Shapiro Show, where you'll get a whole lot of that and much more. We'll see you there. Mm-hmm.